Hello everyone uh, and welcome to Stories on the Rooftop. We're delighted to have you all with us today and wherever you are we hope you're keeping safe and well. My name is Elisa Mita, uh, team member for Stories on the Rooftop, uh, which is part of the, Aga, part of the arts and culture portfolio with the, uh, within the, the Aga Khan Youth and Sports Board. Stories on the Rooftop is a platform for sharing personal experience and engaging in open dialogue uh, with each other and through these conversations, we seek to enhance our understanding of the diversity of experience within our community and connect with each other on issues that matter to all of us. I'm delighted that Jasmine Jeeva will be our speaker today. Jasmine is a journalist and documentary producer and director. She will share her journey of storytelling across three continents, putting empathy and individual voice at the heart of her work to show and encourage connection through our shared experience as human beings despite the varied circumstances in which we may be living. Just a quick note that during the session, there will be reference to difficult and sensitive situations such as genocide and hostile environments. In case any of you have children or other members of your family who may be sensitive to that type of content, we wanted to bring, you, uh, bring that to your attention at the outset to ensure that you're in a private space during the session. Before I hand over to Jasmine, I'll just run through a few logistical points. Jasmine will share her story for the next 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for question and answers. Please type your questions into the chat space at any time during the session, and we'll aim to get to each of them in turn. At the end of the session, we'll have a short evaluation survey, which we would appreciate if you could complete. Please do switch on your video if you feel comfortable and put your display name as your real name. It's always nice to see faces and know who everyone is that's with us today. Finally, as I mentioned, Stories is all about sharing personal experience, and we want to have a safe space in which everyone can share their views. So please be respectful of each other when sharing your questions and comments. So with that, I'd like to invite Jasmine to begin. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you so much, Elisa, and um, it's so nice to see everyone here. Thank you for inviting me to be part of Stories on the Rooftop and for that really warm welcome. Um, I appreciate the work of your whole team for making this event happen and bringing us together to share this space today. Um, it's so great to be here and a pleasure to see so many of you here with me. Um, hello to everyone who's online and thank you for joining. So as you can see, I'm in a time zone where it's still light. Um, so currently I'm living in San Francisco and I'm pursuing a moonshot goal to use technology to connect one billion survivors of various different experiences through their personal stories. Now this might sound a little bit ambitious, but that's why I'm using the term moonshot. And how I got to this point was through a career in journalism and filmmaking. I started as a print journalist and I ran a newspaper as an editor. I went on to work on a six part documentary series for BBC World about human trafficking. And that led me to produce and direct documentaries on human rights and sociopolitical issues around Europe, the Middle East and Africa for a few different international television networks. But while interviewing people from different countries for these films, one of the most striking things was the lack of empathy and understanding and connection between different cultures and on different sides of political arguments. But that the human experiences that people would talk about in their interviews were very similar across borders and across political lines. So I began a journey to create an online platform to try to connect survivors of different experiences through their personal stories to show the similarity of human experience no matter where you live. And I moved to San Francisco, the kind of global tech hub, um, to pursue that dream with two software engineers who co-founded a company with me over here so we could achieve that. So during this session, I'll share aspects of my journey. I'd love to tell you about some of the projects in other parts of the world that I've worked on. And I'd like to tell you about how an inkling of desire can be transformed into taking initiative in 
the oddest of ways to lead to something that that enables um, an outcome that resonates with with some of your deepest desires and dreams and also how empathy and hope can be evoked through storytelling. So firstly, I'll talk a bit about my work producing and directing documentaries on sociopolitical issues and human rights. This was often in hostile environments like Israel and Palestine and unstable parts of Africa. One of the films that I made was about women in Liberia who went on sex and hunger strike during the Civil War. And this led to the election of the first female head of state in Africa, who was President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia. And I'll share my screen and show you a couple of pictures of the women who campaigned in order to make this happen. So these are some of the women who lay in this field for 10 months and refused to go home because they wanted to really stress to their husbands and to the men in their families to put down their weapons. And this actually did lead to the end of a civil war that had raged for a few years. And it motivated a groundswell of opinion that led to the election of the first female head of state in Africa. So setting up an interview with the president was a bit of a challenge. Um, her press people were quite caught up in bureaucracy. I was being drowned in endless paperwork. So along with my crew, um, which consisted of a camera person and somebody that was helping us to navigate the ground in Liberia, we literally ran after her in the street during the country's Independence Day anniversary celebrations and managed to ask her to give us an interview and she scheduled that for us at her office. My job producing and directing involved being given an idea for a film by my boss. I would then research the film, um, I would set up the interviews, I'd go to the location, carry out the interviews, work with the camera person to get the best visuals to tell the story, and then go back to the office and work with an editor and together we'd piece together the film. One of the films that I made was about the genocide in Rwanda 20 years on. And one of the most striking memories was standing in a church filled with the clothes of people that had been massacred who were hiding out in the church and unfortunately were not lucky enough to leave with their lives. And their clothes were kept in the church as a memorial. Um, but the film was about how the country had moved on since that time and how each family had sat in their gardens with genocide perpetrators who apologized to them for killing their relatives. And it was only if forgiveness was given that they were allowed to go back into the communities instead of spending their lives in jail. And this was called the Gachacha court system. And today it's led to marriages between people from different tribes whose relatives had killed members of each other's family. And there's a picture that I'll show you here um, on the shared screen of Daniel. Uh, this is a screenshot from one of the documentaries and Daniel and his wife are from different tribes. Um, and they were in this situation where they'd both lost members of their families at the hands of each other's tribe. And as you can see here, she says, you know, we've experienced the same problems so we can work through those together. So I went on after that um, while I was working on some of these films to want to do some independent work. And I made a film called Shine Your Light, which is about everyday Kenyan women who were inspiring because of the struggles that they were enduring on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I started working on that after I, after I saw a woman with a baby strapped to her back selling sweets on the side of the road. And I found her resilience incredible. 
So I'm going to show you a picture of her as well. I really wanted to recognize the value in what she was doing. As you can see, she didn't have a sweet stall. She didn't have, you know, a tuck shop on the side of the road. She didn't have a chair. She was standing there with her baby and I would go to Kenya on um, the local transport and anyone who's from East Africa or has traveled in East Africa will know that um, the local transport there is called a matatu. So I'd go to work on the matatu and I would see this woman from the window um, every single day and she was there without fail. I wanted to do something to recognize her value in what she was doing, the skillfulness and the resilience to stand out there every single day. So along with an all female crew for International Women's Day, um, we made a film about five extraordinary Kenyan women like this one, living very ordinary lives. And one of the things that she mentioned in her interview that the, the translator who was a Kenyan woman, woman told me about was that she, one of her main concerns was buying soap and washing her hands and making sure that her environment was clean. And that at the time was surprising to us that she would spend so much of her interview talking about keeping her hands clean. And it's only now in the midst of a COVID pandemic that we understand the importance of washing our hands and how something like that can literally become center stage of our lives for a few weeks. And that kind of enables more empathy because we can relate to her. But I'm gonna come back to that in a, few, in a few moments. So luckily for me, going to Kenya was more than just work because I ended up meeting a guy and he was an entrepreneur who started a company that collected data from remote and hard to reach regions in Africa. So while I was kind of flying across the continent, directing and producing these socio-political films, we got married on Diani Beach in Mombasa. And of course, I'm going to show you some pictures of this as well. Um, but when I moved to Kenya, nothing was further from my mind than meeting my life partner when I was only going there to take a job. Um, so I went to Kenya for work and I came back from Kenya with a husband. Um, and around the same time, I started to consider what are the flaws within the media? What's, what's wrong um, with our media today? And what I found, and I'll use a kind of old school media term, um, which is that many stories are left on the cutting room floor. And when you're in the edit room and you're literally cutting video, you're cutting out pieces of your interviews and pieces of footage. And those stories are left on the cutting room floor. And I realized that the media honors sensationalist voices, the popular, the controversial, and at the same time, I was beginning to find beauty in survival, in the faith, the tenacity, the joyfulness and the simplicity that goes into surviving your day to day life. The natural, the rawness, the authenticity, the grace under pressure. And I, I felt that these were skills that were that were worthy of going on a CV or a resume for a job that someone might apply for in the United States or in the UK. But the people that were experiencing these day-to-day -day realities, they may not even have a pen. They may not even have a piece of paper. They may not even know how to write. Um, but I can write, I can publish, and I can help to get their voices heard, to celebrate their humanity, and to enable not just me to hear their voices, but many people to be inspired by their stories. So I started going into slum areas and interviewing women. Um, and ordinary women that were doing different things. Some of them had set up um, tailoring businesses so that they could become entrepreneurs, so that they could own their own boutiques someday. Some of them were just selling vegetables. Some of them were 
campaigning against police brutality, for example. And these are um, some of the women who I was interviewing. Um, these are some of their faces and their stories really spoke to everyday resilience, the everyday survival and the everyday pursuit of something, something different. What I found was that people on the ground who often help foreign journalists to find their stories were best placed to begin to tell these stories because they know their neighbors, they know their friends, and they can seek out these stories from within their communities. And I would call them citizen journalists because they are speaking to people that they know, they're retrieving information and they're bringing their stories to the light. And a story that broke recently that was the result of citizen journalism, as I'm sure everyone in this, in this room or in this Zoom has probably heard about it. The name George Floyd is a name that we now know because he hit the headlines when a police officer had his knee on his neck for enough time to take his life. That event going out into the public was journalism by a citizen. It was filmed by a teenage girl, Darnella Frazier from Minneapolis, who is from the black community. She wasn't a journalist, but she broke one of the biggest news stories of this year. She was a high school student who'd gone to the supermarket and on her way back home, saw that this incident was happening and got out her phone and filmed it. Because of her background, being part of the black community, growing up in the local area where George Floyd lived, she understood the culture and the context in which black people have been racially abused in the US. She was able to use the footage in a culturally sensitive and, collect and contextually aware way. Someone else may have interpreted what happened differently, not as injustice, but as glory, as supremacy, as necessary. They may have even distributed it in a circle of people within which the response would have been very different from this global outcry against racism that we witnessed ensue as the, the recent wave of the Black Lives Matter campaign. And that's the difference between someone who's got awareness of context and culture disseminating information and someone who does not. And it's, it's very common for foreign journalists to fly into different countries to work with someone on the ground who helps them to navigate hostile environments, who can signpost you to danger zones and who can keep you safe and who ultimately will lead you to find the best stories because they know exactly where to find them. So when I set about starting to build the platform with the two engineers um, from Amazon and Snapchat that became interested in this idea of survival storytelling and telling everyday stories of people um, living their lives and affirming the value that they inherently have. It was based on the idea that citizen journalists would be able to contribute stories from their home countries and their hometowns. And the platform would kind of provide global coverage for these local voices from Kenya and from around the world. And that's actually the vision with which I came to this tech hub, to San Francisco, to try to make that viable in the climate financially and talk to talk to people about sustaining it from a business perspective. Well, I just want to spend a few minutes saying that this is not the first time I've had to take a little bit of a risky um, you know, it's not the first time there's been a little bit of a risky twist to my to my journey. Um, as you may know, you know, in journalism, it's a hustle. You have to take initiative, and sometimes this can involve risk. Uh, so there's a couple of funny stories about my first job, which was a documentary series for BBC World, where 
I was told that I was a researcher and I needed to be in an office in London, uh, kind of tied to the desk. Um, while the crew was out and about in these different locations like India and Kenya um, and Tanzania telling stories of um, people that had been trafficked. Um, and I wanted to be out there on the field. So I was doing Hike for Life that uh, December, which you, you probably know about as, you know, a focused fundraising um, challenge that invites people to hike for a few days um, to raise money for focus and my flight back had a stopover in Nairobi and I decided to take my chances and go and meet the crew and tell them that actually I could do my research from from there on the ground and I wanted to um, be part of the shoot um, and on arriving the executive producer kind of saw me and came over and said no we need you to go back to the office in London. So there I was on, on my flight back home. Um, but luckily, the next time I tried to take some initiative, it did actually work in my favor. Um, I was working on a studio program about Israel and Palestine um, based in London. And I was talking to many Palestinian people who, whose stories I was telling remotely. Um, during my Easter holiday, the Palestinian correspondent was going from our office to Gaza, where he was usually based. And I asked him if, you know, can I just get on the flight and travel with you? Um, I thought, you know, I've got a few days on my hands. Let me see if I can get into Gaza and put together some kind of report. Um, I didn't get into Gaza, as many people did not who were at the border, who I met. Um, and I made a report about all the people trying to get in, the people with medication, the people that wanted to visit their sick relatives that were not allowed to cross into Gaza past the blockade. And I went back to the office with my footage. I edited it into a short news report and I was given an opportunity to go to the West Bank as a correspondent and make um, seven documentaries um, in Palestine. I later went on an assignment in Rwanda um, with the same company and that's when I got a job interview to join a company in Kenya um, uh, and again I organized a flight with the stopover of a few hours and this time I went to the interview and managed to get the job and within a couple of months I was relocating to Kenya. I think um, Something that I just want to briefly touch on is the self-expression or intuitive voice that is sometimes a quiet voice inside us which wants something. Um, usually it's something that scares you. Often it's something that people around you don't do or may not even support initially. Um, there might be artists here in, in the room. Um, and it's, it's a creative, it can be a creative process. Um, and sometimes that is what has led me down um, a less conventional path, that has led me to take the initiative, that has led to things that have fulfilled some of the opportunities that I'd been trying to create. So lastly, storytelling is very much about empathy. One of the things that I'm inspired by is the meeting of survivors from different countries, from different times in history. If a survivor of which we've already talked about, genocide in Cambodia, could meet a survivor of genocide in Bangladesh, could meet a survivor of genocide in Rwanda, what may they share? What might heal? And what hope might be sparked? what injustices could be tackled and who might be brought to justice with this united front that defies history, that defies politics and simply stands up for human experience and the cohesion of several people believing in the same cause. So I'm going to show you my last picture. So this is Yasmin from Burma and Dora from Germany. 
Dora survived the Holocaust. Yasmin survived the genocide in Burma. That is empathy, that is hope, and that is building community through common experiences. I interviewed Yasmin and she has now, you know, she was on the run in Thailand and has now been resettled in Canada. So she was able to meet Dora at the Holocaust Museum in the US because she's able to travel. But so many of these survivors do not have visas. They cannot travel. They are stateless um, when it comes to um, people who survive genocide. They're often refugees. So it's telling our stories and sharing our stories that can that can that can be in place of these meetings that can enable you to virtually know somebody through the story that they'll tell and sharing stories with others who can relate to our stories brings us closer stories about our human experiences connect us together even where the context like yasmin you know having experienced a very recent genocide dora having experienced a genocide decades ago the context is very different the politics are very different one is in the west one's one's from the eastern world the developing world and their ages are different but their stories connect them together and this is this is a way of enabling the media to work for us and to spark empathy through storytelling. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I really welcome any questions that you might have um, and look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you so much, Jasmine. What, a, what an incredible journey and, and so much kind of inspiration and, and hope that, uh, that comes through in, in what you just said about kind of connecting people through shared experiences, um, despite very different contexts and backgrounds. I found it uh, really, really fascinating. So thank you. Um, so I invite everyone now, if you have questions, please do put them in the, in the chat and, and we'll get to them all in turn. Um, I can kick off with a, with a question uh, for you, Jasmine, if, if you like. Um, and I was wondering uh, if, you know, how do you gain the trust of people who have who've been through difficult experiences, um, how do you gain their trust and make them feel safe and comfortable to to tell their stories, um, given you know the the experiences that they've had? I often find that, especially in the developing world, that people really want to tell their stories. They they trust that telling their story today might lead to something better happening tomorrow um, and the faith of that is really incredible um, and this is something that seems to be characteristic often in poorer communities and in the developing world that there is there is faith there's optimism and that was something that that I found really inspiring when I was working in those regions um, but trust is also built depending on who you work with because every journalist who travels to a foreign country will work with somebody on the ground unless you know they've been there many times or they live there um, and it's that person that you know it's your choice about that person picking someone who who can navigate the environment who knows people who um, can almost be the bridge between you and that person so I think I think that's that is really key in in um, enabling people to trust you enough to share their stories. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions come through. Um, there's one uh, that that asks: When reporting stories, have you ever been censored? I have not ever been censored. Um, well, that's a great question. 
I've never been censored when I've been out and about on the ground by anyone who stopped me. But there is censorship when you work for television channels. And in particular, the Iranian TV channel that I worked for when I was making films um, in Israel and Palestine, Press TV, had a definite agenda in pushing forward the anti-Israel and anti-US rhetoric. And that came across in the advice that they gave me, in fact, the condition that they gave me, um, <laughs> not to interview certain people um, in Israel and um, I didn't agree with it and I think to tell a story you need to have you need to have balance and to to hear the perspective the opposite perspective can often prove your argument more than it disproves it um, so there was definite censorship there um, and it, it was it was a great experience. Um, it was a platform for the Palestinian people who were underreported in the mainstream media. So I do think that it helped to um, redress uh, the balance um, uh, there and and give Palestinians a voice. Um, I found though that from having that very pro-Palestinian um perspective and speaking to palestinians on the ground on a daily basis and reading what was in their media outlets that many channels censor i noticed that the bbc would report on things differently to how we were reporting on things that they would leave out certain factual information um, so in the mainstream media there there definitely is censorship and I experienced an extreme example of it um, but it is there which is why social media plays a huge part in allowing more of a balance to come out yeah that's a that's a difficult one to navigate um, a couple of people have actually asked about your current project and and the work you're doing uh, with the engineers you mentioned in San Francisco and and asking about what are the kind of the key aims of that of that project the aim of it is to tell one billion survival stories from around the world and connect survivors through their similar experiences um, and enable them to not just have a platform where their voice is shared um, by citizen journalists on the ground who are well placed in the context to tell their stories but also to enable them to have a connection with each other to talk to each other and to be able to share, to heal, to learn, um, to hope and to inspire people and each other. That's great and we look forward to hopefully seeing it <laughs> come to fruition once it's, once it's up and running. Um, Thank you. There's another question here, um, which piece of journalistic work are you most proud of and has had the most impact on you? I think it was actually the first the first documentary that I made, which was in Palestine, and it was about the Palestinian bid for statehood. And it was the, my first piece of field work where I had to present, produce, and direct a 30 minute documentary along with um, somebody on the ground called a fixer um, and a camera person. Um, and one of the, one of the kind of, most memorable parts of that was going to a protest where tear gas was was fired where there was soldiers kind of standing on the hills um but there was this um camaraderie amongst the protesters and i was there covering it um and on the ground and i think there was just something about that first experience that made it fulfilling and memorable um, being being in a hostile environment as a journalist you're kind of told by your editor that you know they don't just want to pull some archive footage off the internet that you have to be in the shots when you're presenting so i had to put myself in a situation where i had to be in the shots with the tear gas going off behind me and explain how it became difficult to breathe in that environment and what the protesters were going through so i felt that there i could really bring light as an outsider 
to something that people were experiencing on a daily basis and what they were the lengths that they were going through in order to to create a better life for them in order to hold on to their homes in the West Bank. Wow, what a what an incredible first experience. Um, so based on that and, and obviously all the other work that you've done, what advice would you have for young aspiring journalists? I think follow your, you know, follow your passion. If it's something that's interesting, go for it. Um, there's three different things that you can do to get to get into the industry and to start carving out your path. One is network. And we've got a fantastic network here in the Ismaili community um, and more and more journalists um, around the world in our community. And if you have friends, um, siblings, your siblings have friends, your parents have friends who are in journalism, you know, arrange a call with them talk to them, ask them about their work, tell them what you want to do, see if there's any opportunities. The second thing is work experience. Um, as many industries are, journalism is highly competitive and working for free can often be the norm. And if somebody, you know, doesn't want to take a job, there's always 10 people lining up that are willing to do it for free. So work experience, um, if you're a student, you know, during your holidays, go and do a week or two of work experience, apply at as many places as you possibly can. Um, and the third thing is really just having the determination to, if you're interested in telling a story, tell the story, you know, get your phone, go and film it, go and do it, write it, publish it, um, and, and, and do it yourself. Um, that's part of your portfolio as much as anything else is. Um, but I would say something that's being talked about a lot in the US and maybe in other countries right now is how in these some of these industries, and I'm particularly exposed to journalism um, because that's my industry, that there's not that many people that look like us in our industries. Um, and this is something that's being talked about much more now than it was when I was studying or when I was growing up or when I was making decisions to go into the industry. Um, and there's more and more people that, that look like us. And there's more and more of those role models to aspire to that you think if they can do it, I can do it as well because they're similar to me and they did it. Um, and there's more and more people like that. And um just that it's it's on our shoulders to carve that out for future generations to follow the things that we really want to do so that we can be the you know the the uh, the the platform or we can we can enable other people to have that platform because they can see us doing what we want to do so i would say if you want to do it you know try to do those three things that i mentioned and um just to go for it you know just just follow that that intuitive voice great advice there thanks jasmine um one other question um how do you kind of cope mentally with you know some of the difficult things and the difficult places that you've been to the difficult things that you've seen uh you know some of the the very kind of um extreme um uh things that you've had to to witness does that take a toll on your mental health and, and how do you cope with that? I, I generally find it inspiring to meet people. Sometimes I, sometimes, um, I remember when my parents watched my documentary about the genocide, both of them were in tears at the end. And I think it hit home with the connection of being from East Africa and being somewhere that's, um, seeing such horrors go on in somewhere that's so close to home. But when I was making it, I didn't, I didn't feel that emotional. And I feel inspired when I meet people um, who have struggled, um, particularly when working in Africa, I have felt their spirit and their energy to be something that has really motivated me and, and inspired me. Um, and I see the resilience and I see the joy and the hope and the faith um, in the most difficult of circumstances. And I recognize the kind of beauty of the struggle, the beauty of the human characteristics 
um, that are necessary for survival, which is something that, that all of us need to do as a prerequisite to us thriving. We, we need to survive. And I, you know, I celebrate and really honor those experiences. Um, I think that I always had an awareness that these things were happening, um, you know, as all of us do. For me, even if I was in London, uh, you know, in my home, I felt like the, some of these tragedies, some of these global events, that they may as well be happening next door. Like, it felt very present for me. So going there and being there almost felt like I was doing something to make a difference. I was there acknowledging that this is happening um that you know i am here witnessing this and that means that you know that that honors your experience um and that means that you're not alone so it was it was kind of i mean i guess selfishly like it was something that that actually um was less difficult because that's the perspective that i've that i've had like well you know, while I've been growing up and, you know, through my life, I feel inspired to be in those environments um, and to be there trying to raise awareness and, and, and just being there as a witness. Um, and, and again, I think that, you know, mental health, um, there's, you know, there's a multitude of challenges in all of our lives and especially with COVID and at the moment, you know, we're being challenged in so much incredibly and in a very unexpected way. Um, I think that speaking about my experiences in terms of the mental health piece, you know, I think that really following your passion is actually a great source of, of satisfaction. Um, and enabled has enabled me, I think, to kind of keep my mental health in check in terms of taking an unconventional path that for me feels right. Um, and that for me kind of feels like I'm fulfilling something that is satisfying for me that has been that's been helpful. Um, yeah. So I think when you really pursue that desire, it gives you it gives you a lot of satisfaction. That's what I've what I've experienced. And even in difficult circumstances, you somehow find the strength to to navigate those. Well, thank you for that very uh, honest and um, and thoughtful answer there. Um, so a couple more questions. Um, what's your view on social media? Do you consider it to be a friend or a foe of credible journalism? <laughs> That's, that's a great question, really well phrased. Um, well, I think it's a threat to the mainstream media. And I think that anything that's a threat is actually a good thing because it reduces the, the kind of monopoly. Um, San Francisco is, a, is an environment that's very much geared towards disruption and disruption in any industry like the way that Airbnb disrupted the hotel industry is, you know, is something threatening. Um, so I think that um, that's not, that's not a bad thing. Um, um, was, did the question say friend and foe to the media or just in general? Of credible journalism was the phrase. <laughs> I think that it facilitates more voices coming out. Um, however, it, it cannot fall under the banner of credible journalism because it's, it's opinion, a lot of it, and the facts are not necessarily verified in the way that a journalist would verify the facts. I mean, all I can really say is that I think that the platform that I'm building actually is almost like a center point between social media and mainstream journalism, where the information is, um, is taken through the same process of making sure that things are factually accurate um, and telling the story in a way that's engaging um, and necessary um, and relevant um, and yet fitting into the mainstream uh, 
in some way, in, in that way, but also gleaning this unique and original information from social media sources, from voices on the ground, um, and from the voices of people who may not be seen and heard and recognized in the mainstream media. So um, I, I, you know, I kind of hate to answer that question with my own project, but I suppose that is my journey and that's what I've gone through and that's what I, what I believe in. Um, I think that, that it plays a great role in challenging not just the media, but also authority. You know, social media plays a great role in that challenge and social media will probably be, never be as free as it is today. Um, the censorship will come in, the guidelines and the protocols will come in. Um, and so we've been in a very unique time in history. And it plays an excellent role in challenging. Um, but everything that we see on there, we need to make sure that we balance it with other sources. And I would say that for mainstream journalism as well, to get to get a very broad view is probably the most accurate and reliable information to look at local sources, to look at social media, to look at mainstream sources and enable each to kind of, um, you know, almost like being your own investigative journalist and figuring out what's true from all of these sources. Definitely a complex question. There could probably be a whole session just on, on that question alone. Um, so we're going to just get into the last, the last couple of questions. Um, who are your role models and what continues to inspire you? I think what continues to inspire me is this, is this kind of idea of pluralism around stories from different contexts and different cultures and across political lines having similarities and that similarity lies in the human experience. Um, I'm inspired by so many people and I think particularly it's it's women who who will be there who will try to say their piece even if it's not easy. Um, there's other personal life and as role models um, in the media that I find inspiring. Thank you. And if there was one person past or present you could interview, who would that be? I mean, something that's been huge recently is of course the Black Lives Matter campaign. Um, and there's been so much exposure to that in the US with there being this whole layer of society that of course had its roots and history in slavery. Um, and that's something that the, the legacy of that is here every day on the streets. Um, I, I think I like to go back in time and be able to cover what people were experiencing and how the revolution against slavery happened. Um, so Martin Luther King would be somebody that I'd love to interview um, because I think that being trapped in that kind of situation is something that um, took so much grit and um, dedication and well I mean it, it just was this um, this kind of pursuit of something that you almost can't imagine but you know that things need to be different um, and I would love to interview him about that and and also some of the people that experienced slavery at that time and what it was like going through that situation how they managed to cope and survive and how ultimately they managed to overthrow the um the dictatorial systems that were keeping them in that in those situations yeah that would certainly be that would be interesting uh, I think for, for all of us to, to have an insight into that. Um, thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, I think we're coming to the end, so um, we'll, we'll wrap up. But um, just thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us today, being so open um, in sharing your experience and, and giving us some great insights into the world of journalism and, and telling, kind of, telling the human stories behind some of the things that, that we may or may not even see um, in the media and, and things that we may not be aware of. But, are there and, and our shared experiences that that we may not realize that we have with with so many others um in different places and we look forward to to seeing more of your work um so jasmine do you want to do you want to say a few words just to wrap up 
Well, thank you so much to your whole team, Elisa, for um, inviting me to be here and um, to the AKYSB event team. Um, it's just, it's been brilliantly organized and just seamlessly considering the situation that we're in um, and taking this online and, you know, enabling this amazing uh, program, Stories on the Rooftop, to continue. Um, so just really want to say thank you so much and thanks to everyone who was listening. Um, and it was nice to see some familiar names and also some new names. Um, and uh, yeah, just um, thank you. Yeah, thanks also to you all for, for joining us this evening and taking the time. Um, we do have a short um, evaluation, which we would really appreciate your, your help with and, and your feedback. So I'm going to share um, a, a link to the survey, which we, we really hope you can take a few minutes just to complete. Um, it would help us to plan for um, future events. So we'd really appreciate your, um, your feedback. Um, but thank you, and we'll, we'll be back in a few weeks with, with our next session. We'll bring you information on that very soon. Um, look out for it in, in the usual channels. Um, but thank you all for, for your time this evening. Thank you for joining us, and take care wherever you are.